One of my earliest memories is seeing a hyacinth blooming at my grandmother's. I was not permitted to touch it, so I remember distinctly having my hands behind my back and bending over to smell that hyacinth. From there on, I was hooked. <laughs> we don't think about the fact we've been doing it 34 years. That we just think about, you know, this is another day in the life of Peregrine Farm. But many times, you stand up from picking something, you look around and you go, wow, this is what I do for a living. Because it doesn't feel like this is a job. We just exist. This is what we do. And we've done it a long time and have become the old rats in the barn amongst our peers. It was all his idea. Yeah, she always says it was my fault. <laughs> we wanted to live in the country and make our living and be our own bosses. There was no family land, because we're first-generation farmers. Those early years were pretty lean. We lived in a tent for eight months. eight months. We lived without running water for 450 days. Started building the house. We built about a third of it that had all the plumbing in the kitchen. If we didn't make it work, we would lose our home. And so that was a real incentive to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to cover stuff when freezes were coming in or you know, a storm was about to happen. One thing about agriculture is it's kind of tyrannical. The reason that it's always in your head is that it has to always be in your head. You could have a weather event and the greenhouses could blow down or the, something floods or lightning takes it out a huge tree and it falls on a building. You know, just one never thinks about what somebody else's real work is. For the two of us, I would say that it's taken both brains most of the time. I don't think I would have been graceful had I been out doing this all the time by myself and then and Alex come home from another job and um, there had been some minor crisis that had to be dealt with at 4 a.m. and he stayed in bed. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so we managed the four acres with four people, the two of us and two other folks. It's about a person an acre is what it takes to, to maintain at this level and this intensity. And so we're all about an even balance of energy expenditure here at the farm. No heroic efforts. We just want it to sort of flow through the season because it's a long year. It's like cooking. It's all orchestrated sort of by 5 o'clock, boom, it's done. And it sort of marks the successful end of a week. Oh, I got the last sweet water you want? In the part of the market, May through September. We can get up here at 4.15 or 4.30 so that we can be out the door in a half an hour with the coffee and uh, over to the pack and shed to load the last bits of things and then get to town. Flying to the bat. Not true. Good morning, sir. What's going on there, man? Crazy guy. If I wanted to hit you, brother. <laughs> I've never seen it coming, would I? Are, are you going to that big wedding today? Hell yeah, I'm going to that big wedding today. 
we have about 100 hours a year to make our living. That's 20 good Saturdays and five hours a Saturday. So we don't screw around with those 100 hours. For us, the farmer's market is fun. It's very social. You get immediate feedback, good and bad. Howdy. How are you? Food that people immediately eat is really such a common denominator. You're sweating away, working hard, and sometimes you think, you know, why am I doing it? And you go to market and people go, I just love that thing. And so you go, great, I'll go out and do it again. realize there's not very many of us who have been at it three decades, going four decades. So we have a point of view that most folks don't. Every once in a while, you know, we think about how convenient it would be to live in town and walk to the grocery store and go to the movies or go to a restaurant. Uh, one of our neighbors, Glenn lived by himself and one day, folks said, where's Glenn? So someone went by the house, and he had died sitting in the chair on the front porch, looking at the view with a Coca-Cola in his hand. And he was just sitting there, dead as a doornail, but just sitting there. And you could tell that he had just, and I would love to be, that'd be the way that I go. I'd just sit there looking at the view. And, That'd be perfect. In my early adulthood as a young mother, I was a waitress and a bartender. And then I was going to open an uptown branch of my vintage clothing store and accidentally stumbled on the building that's the Upper Line and persuaded my son to quit his job as a chef. And we opened Upper Line with 40 chairs and no money for the first week's payroll in January 1983.